After I got home, I had to walk up several flights of stairs, and I had three or four bags of groceries, so it really was not the easiest thing to do in the dark. My mom and I lived together, and it wasn't easy during the blackout because we had very few candles, and, uh, and we didn't really know how we were going to even prepare our food. Right. Well, some of the most vulnerable citizens we have in our community are certainly people with chronic health conditions, some of those people who are reliant on those home health care devices that are powered by electricity, uh, seniors across the system, and uh, even the very young. No electricity, and we immediately had uh, close to 90 trains uh, shut down. Some of them were in the stations, some of them were stranded in the middle of the tunnels. It is warmer, no question about it. And the evidence is the temperature records are, uh, are irrefutable. Power was only out for a couple of days, and yet, uh, uh, I figure that it probably cost the Ontario economy in that month alone about $1.2 billion in lost output. It just happened to fall at a bad time for us and we're probably in the ditch for about 50 grand. I actually have a background in public health and nutrition and food safety and I have a lot of concerns that actually there could have been some real uh, risks to the public with respect to food safety. We actually had to cancel some cases that were not extremely urgent or emergent. If you figure that Ontario accounts for 40% of national output, then, uh, then that would have subtracted for Canada about, uh, about 0.5, about a half a percentage point in terms of growth in that month alone. Making sure that there's you know, um, energy supplies for you know, our children and you know, the, the next generation, that's important. Blackouts. They cripple all workings of community life. The day-to-day -day conveniences we've grown dependent upon suddenly disappear. Darkness permeates. Food shelves can be scavenged. Gasoline and drinking water supplies are drained. And the flow of goods into the community is delayed or halted altogether. Technologies seize. Planes and subway cars lie still while businesses bolt their doors. Healthcare resources are pushed to their limits and the vulnerable are victims. A blackout can quickly become a state of emergency. In August of 2003, an unexpected blackout distressed more than 50 million people in Ontario and the Eastern Seaboard. While this blackout was caused by a downed tree limb, the result of another blackout could be just as upsetting or worse. Imagine what life in Ontario might be like if electricity shortages were to become a common occurrence. Nobody wants that. Hello, I'm Sean O'Shea. Ontario is experiencing an increasing demand for electricity, but with a limited supply available. Till recently, our provincial electrical system experienced its peak demand during the winter months. Now we're experiencing those peaks and higher temperatures during the summer months. Air conditioning, strong economic development, new housing starts, commercial construction, together with an expanding population, have been good in one sense, but it also created a greater demand. It's a demand on our electricity system and resources that could drastically impact the lifestyles of all of us if we don't take steps to conserve our power usage and change our ways starting today. Peter Love is here with me today at a home in the greater Toronto area. He has extensive experience in helping communities reach their energy conservation targets. Now, Peter, over the past few months, we've been hearing that Ontario is experiencing an increased demand for electrical power, but with a very limited supply available. Is that true? It is. I think it's important for people to realize that over the last few years, we really haven't built many new generation plants. There's a few that are starting now, but there was a 20-year period where very little got built, very little new transmission systems got built, and we really hadn't been doing much about conservation. So there is an opportunity now to move forward. We need new generation, we need transmission, and we need conservation. I remember historically, in the winter months, that's when we in Ontario consumed the greatest amount of electricity. Now it seems like we're doing that in the summertime. What's the reason for the big change? Well, it's air conditioning uh, in people's homes and people's offices, and we have now two million houses in Ontario have central air conditioners. Half the housing 
housing stock. This is something that's a great change from 10 and 15 years ago when it was relatively uncommon. Most new houses are being built with central air conditioners. So on a hot summer day now, almost 40% of the electricity demand in the province of Ontario is for air conditioning, keeping stores, offices and homes cool. And that was not the case five years ago. The SEER rating stands for Seasonal Energy Efficiency Ratio, and it's used to um, define the energy efficiency of a particular air conditioner. To put in a new air conditioner today and to put in a 13 SEER air conditioner from uh, a, uh, about a 7 or 8 SEER air conditioner, you see some significant savings. I'm looking at my hydro bill, and it refers to something called kilowatt hours. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, that's the amount of electricity that you actually use. So a, a kilowatt, a watt is what a light bulb would be, a 60 watt or an 18 watt, or if it's energy efficient. So that's the amount of electricity that's being used in any one instant. So if you had a, a, something that uses a thousand watts, that's one kilowatt. And if it was on for an hour, that's one kilowatt hour. Or more typically, if it was an energy efficient light bulb, it's maybe 15, 15 watts, it's on for seven and a half hours, and that would uh, add up to the kilowatt hours over the, over the period of it. So it's the amount of electricity that you're using over a period of time. So the big issue here is kilowatt hours. The fact is that there aren't enough of them. Give me a sense of the supply versus demand equation here when it comes to kilowatt hours. The capacity of our electricity system is measured in megawatts. This is how much generating capacity we have at any one time. This concept of peak demand uh, is very important for people to understand. We've got electricity, a lot of electricity, during many other seasons of the year and many other hours of the year. It's those few hours during the summer, because we are now summer peaking, that's when generation is most critical. So then how much power do we need during the peak periods versus how much power is actually available? Well, we're able to meet supply and demand right now, and uh, we haven't had a blackout or a brownout. We had one a few years ago, which, which people will certainly remember. Uh, that was from a system-wide problem out of the U.S. But uh, there is enough. Our total demand uh, last summer hit a maximum peak of 26,160 megawatts. So that was the peak that we had uh, last summer. During the recent heat wave, we set a new record for electricity consumption. We peaked at 27,005 megawatts. That's over 800 megawatts higher than the previous record that was set in July of 2005. We've never seen that kind of demand on the system before, and hopefully we won't see it again for some time. But clearly the system was strained, and we had to ask people to cut back on their use of electricity during that day because demand was so high. So our base provincial electricity load has increased pretty dramatically. What, what's the reason for that increase? Well, it's the, our economy has grown. There's more people living here. There's more factories being built here. As I said, more air conditioning. We're using more electricity. All of us are using more and more electrical appliances. So all of this is adding up to, uh, to an increased demand for electricity and an in increased consumption. We're hearing a lot more these days about smart meters. Tell mm -hmm. me what a smart meter is and why you think it's a more efficient meter than what we have in most of our homes right now. It's going to be a very important thing. It's going to go along with smart rates as well uh, for, for homeowners. As I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of electricity in the evening. We have a lot of electricity early in the morning. Our peak times in the summer are from noon till six or seven o'clock. That's when it's really expensive for us if we have to bring in power from the US. It's very expensive. Everybody else wants electricity then as well. So what the smart meters are going to be allowing people is to save money by not using electricity during those peak times so that things that you could postpone to later in the day, washing your clothes or washing the dishes, do it after eight o'clock. The electricity is going to be much less expensive. Right now people are not getting that signal. To them the price of electricity is the same throughout the day so the smart meter is going to be a chance for people to save money by postponing when they do some of their energy intensive activities. Okay, there's a challenge I think that you've put out to all Ontarians to reduce their individual consumption of electricity. Mm -hmm. How does somebody do that? Well, there's lots of ways, and we're going to talk about some of them, and our challenge is a 10% reduction. It's something that the provincial government has set as their own target for their own buildings, to reduce their consumption by 10% by 2007. There's lots of things that people can do around the house, and I think that we're going to talk about a few of them. By and large, I'd say that there's two general categories of opportunities. There's things that are, don't cost anything. It's just wise use, turning off lights, turning off computers, turning things off that you don't need. Then there's another category of, of opportunities where we make a small investment in better technology, a light bulb. 
a programmable thermostat, a timer, an energy star appliance, a more energy efficient house. So there's two categories of opportunities. Two categories of opportunities, but are you only asking individuals to try to conserve more power or is this a challenge you're putting out to businesses as well? Well, it's businesses, government, it's institutions, it's everything. In Ontario, we have a relatively balanced electricity system. About a third of the electricity is used by people in their homes, about a third used by office buildings and retail and institutional organizations like hospitals and, and municipalities, and a third used by industry. So we've got programs underway in all three sectors, and I think it's important for people to know in their homes that, that the city hall is doing their bit, that their hospital is doing their bit, the school, the retailer, the office building, the factory. It's important that we all participate on this equally and in our office we have programs in all sectors. So what is conservation then and what does somebody have to do to reach their personal conservation goals? The main thing is that we're just careful with what we use, wise use and, and not wasting and you can do that through behavioral changes, turning things off mm -hmm. and you can do it by technology changes by installing better technology. There's also opportunities as well, the other part of it is to be able to shift some of our loads. So instead of running that dishwasher at four o'clock in the afternoon or using appliances that you really could do it just as well, drawing clothes in the afternoon, to do that later on. We're encouraging people to look uh, after eight o'clock at night. Again, we've got lots of electricity then. And that's when these smart meters will come in and people will be given a financial incentive to postpone some of those uses that could very easily be postponed until later in the day. How will this program of conservation that you're talking about really make a difference? Will an individual's personal conservation make any real meaningful difference in the big picture? It certainly will, and we had a program we launched this, this spring called Every Kilowatt Counts, and to give homeowners a sense that their kilowatt, every kilowatt that they save counts. We have a great example here in Ontario with a program that people participated in, in Ontario called the Blue Box. People's individual actions by recycling one bottle, does that make a big difference? No, but thousands of people, hundreds of thousands, millions of people across Ontario participating in the program, that makes a difference. So that's why the focus of our CAM, we called it, is every kilowatt count. So we all need everybody to participate. We're at the home of Anthony and Lindsay Signorati and we're going to discuss with them their opinions about electrical supply in Ontario and what they have done to conserve. Anthony and Lindsay, what are your opinions about the current situation with power in Ontario right now? Well, Sean, we're very concerned. Uh, it's very clear that there's not enough electricity to go around. The blackout of 2003 made it very clear that we can't do without. So it's up to us to really take some action to get that done. And to be honest, we really weren't that conscious of how much energy we were using. We weren't watching whether we were leaving our computer on or the lights on, but after the issue was raised to us, we realized it was a really serious one. And it makes you realize, I think, that every individual needs to take a little bit of initiative and try and do their part, because it will make a big difference on the whole. Now, does money talk here? Are you guys concerned about the rising cost of electricity in Ontario these days? Sure, ultimately, money does talk in, in this situation. It's not the bottom line, but it would be nice to know that things we do make a real difference in terms of our budget. I think people are frustrated because they have no control over the cost of energy. It's rising, it's getting higher and higher, but looking at some research, it's comforting to know that we can do a small part that will actually affect our pocketbooks. So Peter, what do you think of what this couple is doing and are their concerns valid? Very definitely. And I, I think it's very important and what they touched on in effect is that there's two parts to the electricity bill. There's the rate and how much it costs per kilowatt hour and there's how much you use. It's like going to a gas station. There's not much you can do about the cost of gas. It's the cost of gas. But what you can do something about is how much gas you buy. And I think people are beginning to look at their electricity bill a little bit more carefully now and saying, yeah, what can I do about how much I use? You know, the price per unit is the price per unit. So I'm really encouraged by the, some of the things they're doing. So Anthony and Lindsay, let's go on from there. What are you doing to try to conserve power within your home? Well, I think there's a few simple things. We can raise our air conditioner by one degree. It's not gonna feel any different, but it'll make a big difference on our energy bill. When you leave the house, try closing the blinds. It'll keep the sun out. We also don't use the dry cycle on the dishwasher. And it was surprising to find out how much energy is used in the washing machine just for the hot water cycle. So now we use cold water. It's better for your clothes and it's cheaper for us. We've also changed some of our fixtures in the house in terms of light bulbs. We've changed from the regular incandescent to using the, the higher efficiency ones. Also, we've installed a ceiling fan in our living room. That's made a huge difference, uh, not only in how much air conditioning we use, we've managed to use less, but it makes it feel more comfortable. And 
I tried to remind Anthony to turn off his computer, but he said, oh, it's okay, the screensaver's on. But what did we find out? Well, we found out that it's not actually saving any power. In fact, uh, there's something called phantom power, I believe, where it's still drawing lots of power. And that doesn't apply just to computers. It's your DVD players, televisions, and other appliances that are continually drawing power, even when they don't apparently look to be on. So uh, making some changes that way by plugging into a, a power bar and then shutting that off if it's something that's not needed to run during the day makes a big difference. Was it a surprise to you guys that those kinds of power consumers were, were working without you knowing that? Big surprise, yeah. yeah. So if we're drawing this phantom load the way our couple is, everybody in Ontario must be doing pretty much the same thing, right? It is, and it, as we talked earlier, it's every kilowatt counts because it's, it's not just this, own, this one couple, it's this neighborhood, this town, this part of Ontario, the whole province, it all adds up and, and these phantom loads are going on in every house across the province. The problem is that people don't see electricity all the time. That's true, and I, and I think that they, that's part of what we'll get into with smart meters a little bit, they'll be a little bit more aware of it. Right now people don't see their electricity bill until once every two or three months, so it's a very long feedback loop. I think, Anthony, you've got some research on that. Well, Sean, a friend of ours showed us this little unit called a power cost monitor. And what it allows us to do is track in real time how much electricity we're actually using. This makes it very easy for us to manage our electricity bill. You know, it's been really great. It was relatively inexpensive and studies show that it can reduce your energy consumption by up to 20% depending on your habits. And when we have the air conditioning on all day, you can see the cost jump sky high. Peter, we keep hearing that air conditioning is the, the biggest power sucker, I guess, in the home. Mm -hmm. Is this a fairly recent phenomenon, or is this something that, that has been the case for a while? No, it's very recent. It's certainly in the last 10 years, and we now have half the households in Ontario have a central air conditioner, two million households. So it's become more and more common. Most new houses are built, if they're not built with the air conditioner in it, it's put in shortly after construction. So it's, a, it's become a common feature in many houses. Some of these units as well are getting older now and we know that they're quite inefficient. If they haven't been maintained, they're even less efficient than when they were first purchased. So that's one of the first things we want to look at is the opportunity to look at uh, changing out older air conditioners to bring in a new one or maybe even not even using an air conditioner, using a fan and there may be opportunities in certain situations where that can make some sense as well. I think a lot of people don't want to have to suffer through a long hot summer. I mean what's the best way for people to try to manage the temperature inside their house so that it's still comfortable. Probably the best thing is the programmable thermostat. And I, I know you guys have one in your house and people typically think about it for the winter to lower the temperature perhaps at night uh, when they don't need it so hot and so cool in, in, the, in, the, in the house. But to use it in the summer is really important as well so that when the two of you work, when you're, when you're away during the day, you can let the temperature of the house go up a little bit and then have it automatically come back down again. The other thing we're finding is a lot of people set their, their temperature of their homes really lower than it needs to be. A lot of office buildings are actually so cold and you and I were talking about that. A lot of people are complaining their office buildings are so cold that, that they have to wear sweaters and sometimes even put on a baseboard heater at their feet because the temperatures is just too cold. What's the right temperature? We have a program this summer we're encouraging people to, it's called It's Up To You. Whatever the temperature was before, raise it two degrees. You're going to save a lot of energy, you're going to save a lot of money, and a lot of office towers downtown, you're actually going to be more comfortable. So for a condo owner or somebody who lives in an apartment, somebody who has a room size air conditioner as opposed to a central air conditioner, how do some of these tips apply to them? Well again, some of those room air conditioners can be quite old and again, they never get serviced, we know that. And taking that old one back and getting a new one can have tremendous savings. The technology has really improved in those room air conditioners and a new unit that you buy now would use less than half the electricity that you'd be using in an older unit, especially if it hasn't been maintained. And as I said, these units don't tend to get maintained. There's also an option for consumers called Energy Star Appliances. What are those about? It's a very simple way for anybody to know that this is an energy efficient product. It is only a, allowed for products that are in the top quartile. That means that they're, they're in the top 25% of all units in that category. So every appliance in Ontario will have an EnerGuide rating that'll show how efficient this unit is compared to the best, compared to the worst. And you gotta think about it a bit. You gotta see where it is. When you see the Energy Star, that's your symbol of something that is pre-approved as being really energy efficient. So that's the easiest thing to do. You see Energy Star, you know it's good.
Let's take a tour around the kitchen and look at the appliances and let's start with the fridge. What should somebody be concerned about with the fridge? Refrigerator is something where the technology has really improved greatly over the last uh, 10 and 15 years and so older fridges use a lot more electricity than the newer ones. Uh, what we're also very concerned about is that sometimes people will buy a new fridge and put the old one downstairs and put a bit of beer in it and a bottle of wine or two and that those older fridges then use a lot of electricity and that's something we have a program that we've just launched to encourage people to retire those old fridges out of their basement because they really are energy hogs. Peter said the refrigerator is a, can be a real energy draw. How do you think about the use of the refrigerator as a result of what you're doing? I'm a big culprit there. Uh, it's something I do is when we're working in the kitchen, I open the fridge, I take something out and I go to the counter and the fridge is still open. I have to be very conscious to just close the refrigerator as soon as I can. A lot of energy is wasted by just having it open for absolutely no reason. So when you use it, close it. The other big appliance in the kitchen, of course, is the stove. I, I have to imagine that that's a pretty big user of electrical power as well. Uh, it is, and the technology hasn't changed that much. I mean, it's basically a heating element. The interesting thing about stoves is that uh, there's other ways to cook food, and almost everybody has a microwave now, and microwaves use uh, about a quarter of the electricity that would be used in a, in a stove, so something that could be cooked in a microwave. The other technology that uh, we all maybe haven't used as much, but I was in Windsor the other day, and I saw a cookbook for crock pots, and uh, cooking with a crock pot can use much less electricity than cooking in a stove as well, and it, it doesn't have the high temperature, doesn't heat up the kitchen, so it's great during the, the summer as well, whereas when you turn the oven on, you know, it heats up your whole, your whole kitchen and makes the air conditioner work that much harder. And if you don't have a lot to cook, you could use your electric frying pan instead of frying pan on the stove, or consider boiling water in your kettle, in your electric kettle, rather than boiling it on a pot on the stove as well. Why is a microwave a more energy efficient way to cook your food than the conventional stove or oven? Well, it's just a, it's a, just a whole different process and, and instead of using heat, it, it's using electromagnetic fields to do it. It's a technology that we've all seen for a while that's magic to a lot of people, and, and, uh, but it works really well. I mean, it's not that you want to do a, a roast beef dinner in your microwave, but there's a lot of things that can be done very efficiently in a microwave. Um, so I think, as Lindsay was saying, I think the important thing is not to overuse a bigger appliance. If a smaller thing will do like boiling water in a smaller pot that's always a better thing to do and to try to use the right size appliance for the right sort of meal you want to cook. Large screen televisions, home entertainment systems, these are big in homes today. How can we try to use those more efficiently to try to save on electrical power? Whenever you've got an instant on feature of it, you know, it looks as if it's off and you push the converter, the, the remote, and it goes on instantly, that means that that TV is on an instant on basis. It's ready to go. It's constantly using electricity. So, Sean, we were talking earlier about using power bars, and Anthony, I think you'd had some experience with that, and that's the best way to control that phantom load again. I think just about every home has one, maybe two, even three computers. Is there a difference in the amount of electricity that one kind of a computer will use versus another? Well, the computer itself isn't so bad. I mean, it doesn't use that much. It's, it's the monitor that really makes the difference. And even when the monitor looks as if it's not working, it is. And there's, again, standby losses on it. So we really encourage people to look for the more energy efficient, look for Energy Star. That's going to be your best indicator of an energy efficient monitor. Different computers will consume different amounts of power. What kind of a computer screen do you have in your home? Well, now we have an LCD. Uh, once I found out that not only do they look cool, but they are significantly more energy efficient. So it was a no-brainer decision. And I think people are fooled by the fact that when you have your screensaver on, you're saving energy, but you're really only saving your monitor. Now, we know that lighting is a big consumer of electricity in people's homes. And Peter, I know you're going to give us a demonstration of the differences between the conventional light bulb right. and the modern light bulb. Yeah, what we've got here, and this is a, a little unit that, will, that measures the amount of electricity that is being used by different fixtures. And we've got an example here. And this is what I'm sure everybody's familiar with. This, is, uh, this goes back to Thomas Edison. It's uh, you know, 100 years old or so. And this is the familiar technology that we've all, all seen. This is a 60 watt bulb and you can see on this monitor that it's using 59 watts. It's, uh, it's rated as a 60, but it's actually using 59 watts and that's a typical 60 watt uh, bulb giving off that much light. I think everybody in the store has seen these. This is a compact fluorescent bulb. This gives off the same amount of light. It's going to be a different kind of light. This is a bluish light. That other one was a yellowish light, but it's giving off the same number of lumens, which is how you measure the amount of light. And here it comes up 
and this is showing it's actually rated at 16 watts but it's actually drawing 14 watts so same amount of light this one's 60 this is 14 so this is using about 25 percent as much as much electricity as this one it also lasts much longer this will last uh, five and sometimes even 10 years 10 times longer than these older bulbs so they cost a bit more and this is a good example of energy efficiency technology. It's better technology, it's newer technology. It uses less electricity, it lasts longer. So yeah, it takes a little bit more money to invest in it in the first place, but as with all other energy efficiency technologies we've talked about today that you guys are doing, it pays in the short term really. Every home has one or more outdoor lights either to improve security or for decor purposes. Is there anything we can do to try to save money here? Yes, there is, and I see we have a unit over here. So the first thing is the bulbs, and they can be CFLs instead of the incandescent bulbs. Uh, the other thing, outdoor really lends itself well to motion detectors so that the light only comes on if it's for security when someone is nearby and walks in front of it. The other thing is to have a timer on it so that it comes on at, you know, when it gets dark and turns off at midnight or whatever time you want. Because security is important, but you don't need to have the lights on uh, throughout the day. The Ontario Building Code will require homes to be energy efficient, making them less costly to operate. We spoke with Sean Mason of Mason Homes recently, where we compared the difference between standard and energy efficient construction. Sean had this to say. What an Energy Star house is, is a more comfortable home, a healthier home, and also a home that saves you about 1,000 kilowatt hours per year in electrical use other energy savings and also reduces your greenhouse gas emissions by three to four tons per year and that's every year going forward. We use low E argon windows with insulated spacers. We use extra insulation across many areas of the house, an extra high efficiency furnace and an HRV but more importantly what really does the majority of the work for an Energy Star home is actually building the building envelope tighter and to a better higher standard. Certainly there are increased costs to building a home like this with some of the increased insulation or better materials that actually do go into the home. However, unlike a granite countertop, unlike a hardwood floor, the costs that go into an Energy Star home actually pay you back over time. As customers learn they can do a little bit here and a little bit there and incrementally do something better across the whole province to not have a detrimental effect on their lives, it can be very, very powerful. So wrapping up, my challenge to everybody in Ontario is to find ways to reduce their electricity consumption by 10% in their homes and their offices and their schools and their factories where they work. And I think there's some great things that you've been doing, but I think it's important that we all play our part. What we're talking about here are things that are cost effective, they're going to save money, they're good for the environment, they're good for our electricity system. It's going to mean that there's less chance of having blackouts and brownouts and we none of us want to see that in Ontario's electricity future. So Anthony and Lindsay, Peter laid down a 10% challenge. How difficult was this for you guys to meet? Not too difficult at all. It was pretty easy. We've talked about many inexpensive things we can do, even free things. It's just a slight adjustment in our habits. So it's not a lifestyle change. It was, it was a pretty good experience. Very positive experience. We really felt the difference in our budget and our wallets, and we feel like we're making a difference in doing our part to help Ontario save power. Today, conserving our use of electricity is just as important as creating new sources for power generation, perhaps even more so. New power plants can't be built overnight and can be costly. In the short term, conservation is critical. Every kilowatt conserved is a kilowatt that doesn't have to be generated. That not only saves money, but also our environment. The Government of Ontario has authorized the Ontario Power Authority to develop a new plan for Ontario's power supply mix that takes advantage of renewable sources of energy. It will also lay the foundation of how, where and when this new generation will come online. But today, conservation is the key to ensuring that Ontario residents and businesses have the power they need when they need it. Much needs to be done. The first and most important step is fostering a culture of conservation in our province. Only by examining every opportunity to use our electricity more wisely can Ontario hope to successfully address the power needs of our future. Just to make sure that you're really trying to do your part because every little part adds up to the bigger part. Every kilowatt really does count.